Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Queensland Ag Tech Month opening uh, launch. Uh, you're here with us tonight with uh, a few key guests, and none other than um, the the Minister for Agriculture, uh, Mr. Um, uh, Minister Mark Ferner, and uh, we'll be opening tonight. So, so just a bit of background: uh, Queensland Ag Tech Month is an initiative of Queensland Ag Tech Cluster, a group of driven regional entrepreneurs and agri-food ag tech leaders from across uh, the ag tech ecosystem. Yeah, they come together, connect and share support with one another to advance ag tech in Queensland. So through through uh, through the initiatives of a few years ago, we decided to set up a, uh, I suppose, a webinar launch and and aggregate all the events that were of, um, of significance and meaning to the month of November. So so every every November we launch the uh, Ag Tech Month with a webinar. So tonight we've actually got a a, a great lineup uh, to to get through. And uh, and before we start, what I'd like to do is just um, I suppose uh, do the welcome to country. So uh, so we're just going to acknowledge uh, uh, you know the traditional owners. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. And emerging, I extend I extend that that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people here today. And I'm in the Inangai uh, sort of uh, area, uh, uh, calling in from Longreach tonight. So so welcome everyone, and uh, we just wanted to acknowledge that to begin with. Now to start off, I suppose uh, the best uh, the best way to do that is to is to um, I suppose have the minister, but. Uh, what we'll cover tonight is is uh, an opening from the Honourable Mark Ferner, and then we'll uh, go into uh, a couple of speakers that we've got, uh, two from Proven Energy, uh, so from Randall Martin and Nicholas Kemp, and uh, they'll talk a little bit about um, challenges with uh, renewables and installation in remote areas, but also uh, how they can overcome that with new ag tech and uh, and monitoring uh, technologies. So so it's really going to be quite an interesting and. Uh, and a bit of a breakthrough, I suppose, in in terms of uh, how we can manage those uh, those solutions in in regional Queensland and uh, and across Australia, really. So so that'll be great. And then uh, and then we'll throw into some cyber security. So it's really rearing its uh, its head as a, as a bit of a serpent in Australian agriculture with uh, with toll and and the uh, events of JBS uh, over the last sort of eighteen months. So. We just really want to get an expert in on that and uh, and what impacts that might have for agribusiness in general through Lani Rivetti uh, from Cybermetrics. So uh, uh, so we'll, we'll throw to him. But what I might do now is just uh, throw over to the minister and uh, and uh, we're very honoured to have um, the Honourable Mark Ferner for Agriculture, Industry, Development and Fisheries and Rural Communities to officially launch Queensland Ag Tech Month 2021. So I'll hand over to, uh, to Mark Ferner uh, for that. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, James, for the kind invitation to join us this event as we launch Queensland's Ag Tech Month 2021. I'd like to start by respectfully acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians on the lands which we meet here in Brisbane. It's the Yogara and the Turrbal people, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I'm very pleased to be able to be part of this uh, event celebrating Ag Tech in Queensland. Over the last decade, we have seen the evolution of an industry that is transforming how we operate and do business. Tonight, we are going to hear firsthand how tech is supporting a renewable future, our future, and the types of things we must be aware of to keep our businesses safe as we work to digitise our operations and apply new tech. There is no doubt that Queensland's passion for innovation is growing tech is being used to solve real world problems, problems in your business, problems that impact the bottom line and global challenges. Ag tech is offering solutions and locals in regional Queensland are adding to the mix. It's increasingly creating opportunities for businesses across value chain, including those who don't traditionally think of us as agribusinesses. It's creating a workforce of tomorrow that looks very different to that of today, attracting a generation of new talent and new energy. Queensland is home to many ag tech service providers, delivering innovative products and services that are transforming our agricultural landscapes. Queensland's made and service ag tech tools are highly sought after, and that is why we are continuing 
to support the development of a world-class ag tech ecosystem right here in Queensland. The journey to adaption is never straightforward and there can be many speed bumps along the way. That is why we have invested in establishing a dedicated ag tech and logistics hub in Toowoomba. Smart farm facilities and information tools such as the department's ag tech web portal to help others explore the possibilities of agriculture 401. This is new generation agriculture. It's an evolution of thinking and an innovation mindset and research has revealed that there is still substantial room for growth in the adaption and use of these solutions. I'm passionate about Queensland's agriculture and as Minister for Agriculture, Industry, Development and Fisheries and Minister for Rural Communities, I have seen agribusinesses step up and meet challenges head on during the COVID-19 pandemic and adopt uh, the transformative uh, technologies. Businesses are considering their technology options. They are asking questions like, what value does this bring to my business? How does this tech compare to that of the market? How will it integrate into existing systems? What are the longer term service needs required? The agribusinesses and food se uh, sector will continue to play a vital role in Queensland's COVID-19 economic recovery plan. And the Palaszczuk government wants to ensure businesses are able to capitalise on the opportunities presented. I invite you to get involved through Ag Tech Month, reach out and connect with your local Ag Tech community. Queensland has a thriving Ag Tech ecosystem at our doorstep that is vibrant, dynamic and providing uh, particular solutions that can grow your future. The new frontiers of Ag Tech are here. So let's power up with Queensland's Ag Tech. Brilliant, and thank you for the uh, message from uh, the minister there. And you can see how much passion and and uh, and I suppose support that the that the state government has for Queensland Ag Tech Month, and particularly Ag Tech in Queensland. So, so that's brilliant. Having said that, traditionally we, I suppose we have startups and and you know uh, I suppose techniques in Ag Tech that that we cover off on in Queensland Ag Tech Month. And I thought what might be good this year uh, as a collective, we thought that it would be good to actually touch on some of the, uh, some of the, I suppose, the technologies that are evolving in traditional, I suppose, uh, markets and, and no other at the moment is, uh, is more, I suppose, uh, prevalent and, and topical than uh, renewables. So with our friends at uh, Proven Energy Management uh, that, that currently do a lot of regional work in terms of managing infrastructure and, and, uh, and installations and support and, and maintenance in, in regional Queensland in large scale to down to a sort of micro agribusiness solutions. We thought we'd get uh, Proven Energy to come in and just talk to us about the market, what's happening and what are the new technologies available and, uh, and give us a bit of a synopsis. So, so today we've got um, uh, Nick and, and Randall from Proven Energy and we're really looking forward to covering off on, on what they've got to sort of uh, add to Queensland Ag Tech Month and, and uh, welcome gentlemen, uh, are you on the line? Yeah, thanks James. Thank you for inviting us and having along. I'm, um, I'm Randall. And I'm Nick. G'day. Now James, look, I'll look, I'm, I'll look, I'll just give you a quick summary of you know where I've come from to, you know, and um, my history in in the electrical sector, and then and my journey into renewable energy. So, um, and I just want to touch on that because it sort of gives it, it sort of gives a real idea of where 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 we've come from and where we're heading. So, my um, my original, um, you know, I studied electronics, uh, moved into IT. Uh, moved into a family business that was uh, building transformers and in power, you know, and you know, in power distribution. And then from then I um, moved on to be an uh, to become an electrician and starting a um, electrical contracting company. Which along that journey, um, working a lot with you know transformers, power distribution, and from there, I um, you know really grew an early understanding and, and you know of what the network requirements are um, and wanting to really implement um, renewable renewable energy into that space um, 
the the electrical contracting company grew and 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 inside that um inside that body um we started proven energy management um and that's and and that's where i met nick and nick uh, joined you know joined us and now and now we're working together inside proven energy management with me as a real technical electrical background i'll just let nick touch on him on his background yeah thanks randall i um Firstly, I suppose I, I was a country uh, kid myself growing up on a property on the Darling Downs, and uh, then I spent my first 20 years of my working life uh, working in, in, in banking and financial advice uh, disciplines and consulting work. And um, ultimately, I wanted to get involved in the renewable energy space wanted to be, um, you know, get out there and, 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 and build something and, and, and build something for ourselves. So, um, it was a great opportunity to join with Randall and his company to do that through proven energy management. Um, today, what we wanted to go through briefly was um, a bit of an overview of the energy markets and where they are today and perhaps where they're heading a little bit. Talk about some simple things that you can implement in terms of um, renewable energy in your own businesses. And then, um, and then, um, some new technology innovations that uh, we think will over time become a lot more relevant in this space. So uh, probably comes as no surprise to everyone that there are, we're on a, a um, transition. So this slide here is taken from the Network Transformation Roadmap um, and it shows I guess if you look at the left hand side of that chart back in 2015, you had the black and the and the red parts of that chart, uh, brown coal and black coal contribution to the electricity network and as far as generation goes, and a small amount of solar and wind and various other generations. Now, as we move out to 2040, 2050, we're expecting to see basically all of that coal generation phased out of the market as, as well as most of these other, I suppose, um, biomass and gas and so forth. And um, predominantly all energy generation will be either rooftop solar, large utility scale solar and um, wind generation. So there's a huge amount of change underway and we're already seeing that today. The, um, the next slide is, is a snapshot that I took from AEMO, which is Australian Energy Market Operator Dashboard. And this, this slide was taken last week at 11 o'clock on the 27th. What this shows us is a 24 hour period leading up to and some projected um, forecasted loads thereafter. So the green line is the load in the electricity market and the purple line represents the wholesale price of electricity at that time. So the evening peak on the night uh, before the 27th, you see electricity prices rising up to $300 a megawatt hour, which is just what the electricity generators are bidding into the market to supply that, that large amount of demand at the time. Um, that equates to about 30 cents or a little over 30 cents a kilowatt hour and um, is the wholesale price. So obviously uh, doesn't include any of the network charges and, and, and so on. So that's quite a lot of money at, at night. But probably what's more notable is that during the day now, um, we have very low demand, which is, which is basically the result of one in five households now having uh, solar on their rooftop large companies like Coles and Woolworths and Bunnings rolling out um, solar across all of their um, sites. And um, we're seeing we're seeing that market take up and it is already having a, an impact on on those daytime electricity prices. But what I what I see when I look at that chart, I guess, is that that demand and that price of energy through the evening and to a lesser extent in the mornings. And when I think about how most of us have been charged for power up until now, it's been a flat rate 
or um, there hasn't been that big a discrepancy between um, the, the power prices at different times. So when I look at that chart, when I think about the transition that is happening in front of us, I think about um, there is an opportunity for those of us that can adapt, can um, transition more of our loads to those daytimes when we can generate our own electricity or we'll have the ability to uh, be flexible or have storage to um, be able to, to be able to uh, manage our own evening loads. So that, so that's great, Nick, and uh, and you know you can sort of see that reflected in a lot of the power bills that people are experiencing at the moment, uh, and especially going into summer, the the actual impact of, of that of those market forces on uh, on the uh, on, I suppose the um, the business uh, uh, sort of costs and and household costs, uh, and uh, so that throws that quite well. And uh, and and Nick, I'll let you go with this, uh, you know, this uh, this here, and and, uh, and explain this a bit more. Yeah, thanks, James. And and, and I guess um, to add to that, you know, what what we're seeing is that a lot of a lot of the tariffs that were available out there in um, in small business and and farming tariffs have have become obsolete, and there is a real shift to. Um, to time of use tariffs, recognising that the, that that cost of supplying into those peaks in the evenings is uh, is is you know is becoming greater. The difference between those times. So the retail networks are really trying to keep up with this, as well as um, create some new tariff opportunities for businesses that are you know encouraging with a carrot and stick, I suppose, encouraging um, those businesses that have got the ability to be flexible to, um, to, to, to take advantage of those opportunities to use more power during the day or generating their own power and, um, and reducing their load on those critical times in, in, in particular in the evenings. Now, Randall, um, for anyone getting starting on this renewable energy journey, um, what, where would you suggest they focus initially? Well, well, I quite often Nick get asked, look, is solar worth doing? Is is solar for me? And I and and we I quickly answer that question. Do you have a daytime load? And and then you know if you have a daytime load, solar is worth considering. Okay, look, um, the the diagram on the right there indicates a really basic you know solar curve with a with a with a really basic pumping load okay so that's one example but but daytime loads can be at, at, at your home it can be if, you know, if you're running air conditioning it could be in an office running your pools a really good daytime load um, and then and then you're stepping out to industry manufacturing like there's many examples of what a of what a daytime load would would be and you know if one of the really important things which i we try and use and we want to use technology so yes it's all well and good having a daytime load but people will have loads that are maybe run outside of sun hours okay and we and we want to use technology and we and um and we want to be able to bring those loads to be to be time shifted and bring them under the solar curve, and we and we want to look outside the box a bit and have conversations with you guys around. Hey, what are you doing? Um, are you able to move that load? And what technology can we use to try and time shift that load into the solar window? Right, and like across, it's particularly the you know particularly the agri business, we see a lot of water pumping. Right, and you know, can we can we move that water pump to pump during sun hours to move that water, say, from a river up to a um, if you're at a feedlot, you're trying to pump the water from the river up to a turkey's nest, and you know they have had a pump there that's you know that's moving X amount of water, and we, we sort of make a suggestion, hey, why don't we get a bit of look to get a larger pump and pump it during the during the day up to that turkey's nest. So, you know, really simple solutions, but very, very effective, being be very effective around now matching the amount of solar to match that pumping. 
So, and then, you know, cold rooms, you know, making sure, you know, we're, you know, we're looking at, hey, look, we could we could run that cold room a lot harder during the day. What's the temperature of the cold room getting down to? What sort of thermal mass has it got? Um, you know, and then maybe looking at not running that compressor as much after hours. Um, steam in, in all in all sorts of in all sorts of industry, and and a, another example would be you know looking at. Um, like at, at a feedlot, if they had a boiler, um, we we look at complementing that boiler with a element, a a um, element built um, steam boiler, and that boiler would, you know, we would control that, you know, depending on the amount of steam steam power they require, and we would control that with the amount of solar we'd have. Okay, and we and and we can switch in numerous numerous steam steam boilers one of the real basic one of the real basic items which we talk to talk about all the time is actually just heating storage water for you know just hot water like it's one of the most like domestic and commercially it's one of the best storage devices there is like if we can load shift that and you know just through basic timers and run that during the solar window like we're able to Put a lot of energy into that. Um, look, also, so load shifting. Some of the really, like, from a commercial point of view, you know, we've had, um, a, you know, powder coating factories um, who may have started early in the morning, um, and particularly with their sandblasting process, were sandblasting, you know, six or seven hours a day. And we, you know, we would just talk to them, hey, look, we need to time shift when you're doing that activity, put it completely under the solar curve. And we were able to pretty much get rid of the total amount of energy that they were using in, in that process. Very similar to that curve that we've got up on the screen. So one of the core parts of our business, right, and this is, is, is data. Right, and this is where you know me and Nick, like you know, Nick bring his um, his expertise from the uh, from a financial point of view. Nick's really good with spreadsheets; he loves a spreadsheet, and you know, so we and data monitoring, right, and understanding your load. Okay, so you can't manage what you can't measure, right, and. Our, our core business, and, and the more and more along this journey, I'm going to get Nick to run through a few of these in a moment, but this is the crux of making sure you're, you, you're gathering the data, you're, you're staying up, you know, and allows you to implement technology on the back end of, not, of making the right decisions. Hey, Nick, can you run through those graphs? Yeah, thanks, Randall. Look, um, I guess for any project of, 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 of any reasonable value you, you need to be able to make a business case for why you're doing it and it's difficult to do that without having any data or any numbers and um, you know I guess with solar a lot of people have a you know have a sense that it's worth doing um, and they may believe in you know things like um, feed-in tariffs and so forth to, to, to prop up their business decisions. But when, when it's becoming a larger amount of money, you really do need to have some data behind you to back it up. So, you know, in, in agribusinesses and in, in, in any business, things can sometimes be seasonal in nature or um, you, could ha you can have little cycles within a business that, that, that um, change the amount of energy that you're using at any given time and uh, so it's important to identify and uncover these sort of details before establishing a um, you know what, what your project is going to look like so most of the time in a lot of businesses you can gather um, metering data directly from your retailer but um, look there's still a lot of rural communities and um, you know, farms that would not have meters that that uh, support that that sort of um, data collection. But typically, we would we would get what's called uh, NMI data and interval data, which gives us um, actual recorded 
data for every half hour period over a whole 12 months and we'd look at that data to establish what the patterns are and trends are. Without um, that kind of data, we would often suggest either installation of a of a meter um, by an electrician, so actually putting a, rec a metering device in place and, and recording that data in order to establish a baseline for a project. Um, if it's of, of sufficient value to do that. Um, yeah, clearly, if you don't have good data, you probably aren't going to make the best decisions. The next slides here I, is, is an example of a larger project um, where we really do go to the next level in terms of our analysis and, and, and what we've got there is, um, I guess, a heat map. The first heat map, or oh, the, the, the top image there, shows uh, 365 days of energy consumption in, in half hour increments. And um, you start at the bottom of the heat map uh, in, the, in the blue zone, not very much energy being consumed at all. By 6 a.m. in the morning, this site, a feedlot, is uh, coming live. By 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning, you're getting into the yellow and the red, they're really in quite intense uh, energy processes. And then um, by one or two o'clock in the afternoon, you see it tailing off quite considerably back into the blue low energy use. So across that 365 days there, you can see in that top image, it's very consistent and um, you know high intensive energy use environment. Um, the bottom image is, is, is um, indicating what amount of energy is being used after the project. So we've been able to, through this HOMA Pro modelling, we've been able to demonstrate with that actual load data, 12 month load data in the top slide, and then overlay on that uh, the energy production and generation data that has been based on historical um, irradiance, so real recorded data over a long period of time, to determine what amount of energy is going to be generated at um, at any given time. So you, you can see from those slides just how much energy we've been able to displace. It's in fact it was two thirds of the of the uh, energy from the grid is being displaced from the new system. And this is the kind of thing you need when you're making these decisions on a you know a large amount of money. It's a one million dollar project. You, you, you do need a significant amount of evidence to be able to get that, that sort of expenditure across the line, obviously. So Nick, that's, uh, that, that's great. So, so that's pretty much a before and after implementation of solar there, and that's the usage before and, and after from you know, drawing uh, power from the grid. Uh, you know, for a bit of context, uh, in Longridge here, you know, we've got great sunlight, we've got great radiant energy to use and utilise and leverage. And, uh, you know, so we've got a, uh, you know, uh, for a bit of background, we've got a 15 megawatt solar farm uh, here on our place. And and as part of that, we got you guys to come out and actually review our solar. And, and it took a few months to see what the loads were and, and, uh, and assess what the solution can be. Uh, which which was fantastic because we could go in there with uh, you know with that with that data with those measurements to actually inform how we're going to build what we're going to build, and uh, after uh, designing it effectively and evaluating what we what we wanted to do, uh, then uh, you know, then we did the implementation, uh, and now our our power bills uh, you know are ten percent of what they used to be. So uh, you know it's an extraordinary change, uh, and it just makes sense in Queensland to actually sort of pull that in to reduce the cost to our business. But not not only that, I also wanted you guys to talk a little bit about the monitoring of uh, of the systems and and the alerts you can you can actually obtain so that you guys can manage remotely. There's been a lot of cases out here. There's a lot of graveyards of, of sort of solar solutions have been put in, rushed, and then they've withdrawn from the uh, you know from the uh, from the service and left it with local providers which aren't you know that you know that interested to keep it up but but so but so now with technology and data you know uh, you guys are saying that you can actually monitor those systems and evaluate and uh, you know and, and implement changes remotely so i just want to sort of talk a little bit about about that as well uh, you know if, if you've got a slide to go on to that's great but uh, but yeah just wanted to touch on that as well 
Yeah, look, James, no problem. So look, I'll um, I'll I'll touch on that right away because it like this is one of the most important things to me was when I first got involved in in renewable energy um, on any level, whether it was uh, remote or whether it was um, on the uh, grid like these systems are, which we've been talking about. One of the things I was like, I need to know if this unit is working, like um, wherever it, where any, like, irrelevant of where it, it is, whether it's, you know, up the road from my office or, you know, or 16 kilometres in a car. And I needed to understand what was going on, if there was a problem, if it was working. And so along this journey, I found, you know, one of my favourite products um, for Grid Connect has actually been this particular, it, look, it, it's it's called Solar Edge. But th there's many um, inverters now and the technology from all the manufacturers in regards to the monitoring portals, the way they monitor the 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 level of data has improved a lot and it's now really exciting across all manufacturers to see that everyone's really got on board with how important it is and particularly remotely is what you touched on james is like it's absolutely crucial say for instance and, and i'll run through a couple of examples like if if um you know there's some key points for me about you know about solar and one of them is this like you have to know you have to or live data you've got to be able to access to see whether your investment is working right so that's from the customer's point of view from my point of view i need to have live data to access Access it to make sure that it's it's working, it's doing what we said it would do, it's generating and understanding what loads you guys are running. This is you know from these dashboards now are getting quite detailed. You know we're able to see what voltages, if we've had any you know you know any spikes. Um, we're able to see you know the power factor. That's from an AC point of view. From a DC point of view, we're actually able to, with this particular manufacturer, log on and see what every panel's producing. If there's any faults, you know, if if there's if, you know if there's any drama, why you know you know like like it, like you can actually down to panel level understand what's going on. One of the reasons why I really like the panel level monitoring for Solar Edge is managing in some of the environments we've installed these systems in. If, for instance, feed lots. For instance, um, you know, in in the in in the middle of nowhere is dust, right, and grime. So we need to make some decisions and and monitor those systems to see, wow, do they need to be cleaned? Like, have we got to a point where the degradate where where the um, dust is now affecting my production, right? Now. What and and I'm able to do that from my desktop in Brisbane and look at all my sites around town and give advice around, hey, this you're actually going to have to put cleaning into this on this system this particular month where you know we're down three or four percent. But you know, yes, James, like I'm one of the that's one of the major advantages and um, uh, with the, where this technology is here uh, has been head, heading. In the in 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 the past years across across most manufacturers, it's really strong. That's brilliant, mate. And you can see, uh, you know, you can see technology evolving in agriculture quite quickly. But in solar, it's it's actually evolving, uh, you know, rapidly as well. You know, in parallel and and uh, and renewables. And you can see, uh, I mean, you know, we've got uh, switches for our pumps that uh, that are loaded through our solar management dashboard and. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and you know a lot of the ag tech community doesn't doesn't realise the sophistication that the solar renewables have got. So uh, so so that's brilliant. So uh, so in terms of uh, you know in terms of I suppose Nick and uh, you know and um, uh, and Randall wh wh where you guys see the industry going? I mean you, you know there, there's a small percentage of farms that are actually on solar now. So. Uh, in terms of uh, you, you know where you think that technology is going to take you as as a business, do you do you, do you sort of believe that uh, you know you'll have clusters of of um, of clients across regional Queensland that that you'll that you'll service uh, you know and uh, and keep up with and and it'll be enhanced by the technologies that you're seeing coming coming along. Uh, yeah, for sure, James. Um, you know, there's there, there's so much. Um, there's so much technology and, and improvement already we're witnessing in the business. You know, for example, 
um, you know, the machine learning in the back end of um, the technology, our inverter technology can even identify through algorithms um, equipment that is about to have a fault and um, and then they trigger um, and, and, and send out, you know, parts without us even having first had an incident. So there is there is a lot of great technology um, coming through the manufacturers um, the, like the point you made um, around uh, around switching and so forth. There is a, a, a suite of products um, automatically control things, set timers through the inverters um, from your mobile phone, switch things on and off remotely, just depending on um, whatever the needs of your business are or um, or, or, or based on, um, you know, daily uh, requirements. So there's a there's a huge amount of, of, of smarts built into this technology and um, there's so much that we can do diagnostically from Brisbane um, as well as you know is happening automatically um, you know through the through the web. Um, look in I guess in terms of what we see happening I guess it comes full circle around to where we started. Um, there's, there's, there's of course only one in five households at the moment has solar. Um, whilst there's a lot of large corporates on the move installing solar, um, that there, there is still so much of the market yet to go. And I think, you know, everyone will, 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 will end up having their own um, generation on site, and that will be matched with some form of energy storage. Um, where we think energy storage is going will 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 relate very much to where you're using that energy. And just quickly before we wrap up, I just wanted to show some new technologies that we're really excited about. Uh, Randall mentioned some steam and and, and thermal uh, requirements of feedlots. There's there's a um, automated electric boiler there that we control with the inverter using some of those technologies we've already spoken about on the top left. Um, to the right for those in, you know, um, packing and processing. Um, we've got a glacium um, thermal energy storage system, and that um, basically allows us to take solar, pump it into the uh, phase changing materials to get down to very ultra low temperatures, and then use that at peak times when electricity is expensive to, to run our cold storage. Um, so, there's a couple of quick examples. Um, I think we're running over time, so we should probably wrap it up. Yeah, great, Nick. Great, Randall. Great, Nick. I, That's uh, that is that is just the tip of the iceberg on what uh, you know what is possible with solar on renewables in Queensland. And and uh, you know, I'd suggest that uh, if anyone wanted to get in touch with you guys, uh, we can uh, yeah we can provide those details and email to follow up this uh, you know this this call and this webinar. But uh, there's a tremendous volume of information there and uh, and you know utilizing data and machine learning in solar you wouldn't imagine that so uh, so that, so that's brilliant and uh, you know for you for your um, uh, for all your all your, all your um, work that you do Randall um, I see you on the head of the river this year with BBC as well so uh, it seems like you've got uh, you know uh, both teams going well with your solar business your renewables business and uh, you know and on the water so uh, so the sun and the water you've got sorted out. You just need the sand and to get out amongst regional Queensland uh, to install a little bit more. But, but mate, that's uh, that that's tremendous, and uh, we'll provide those details after. But what we might do, and and thanks, gentlemen. Uh, what we might do is uh, is throw across to Lani Rafiti, uh, and uh, we're very honoured to have Lani there today. Thanks again, guys. You guys from Proven Energy, and uh, and Lani's actually got a, a, a great background and and intrinsic knowledge on cyber security. And, uh, and and everything that goes along with, I suppose, uh, you know, uh, making sure your business is secure, but also the supply chains in, in agribusiness. And we've seen, uh, you know, the effects of JBS and toll uh, with, uh, you know, with, uh, with I suppose, all the different wares that are, that are getting in and, and absorbing the opportunities and the flow of those businesses. And uh, yeah, for Lani's, uh, I suppose, um, work, he's been at PwC and, and audited cyber security for, uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers for a number of years while that was on. So, so Lani's uh, doing some consulting uh, across a broad range of industries, and we're quite honoured to have him, uh, you know, as part of our Queensland Ag Tech Month opening uh, webinar launch today. So, I'd like to introduce you all to 
uh, to Lani Rafiti and and uh, and kick things off and uh, and welcome Lani. Thank you, James, uh, and thank you for the invite uh, to the uh, the launch of AgTech uh, Month. It, it's actually quite timely. Last month uh, in October, we had the uh, Cyber Awareness Month, so to flow into uh, AgTech Month and to be able to come on and talk about uh, cyber crime and cyber security in the context of uh, of uh, AgTech is a fantastic thing. And uh, I think you mentioned earlier about industries. Yes, have have done quite a bit of work. Uh, in uh, ag tech as well as food and grocery, you know, across companies like JBS, Aiko, uh, Kilcoin, meat, you know, uh, meats uh, as well. So uh, it's it's quite an interesting uh, industry, interesting sector to work in. So uh, yeah, hopefully the um, what I'm about to share tonight will help, and I'll also share my contact details if anyone has any any questions or anything uh, post uh, tonight. I'd be happy to uh, answer them. The COVID era, you know, over the last couple of years has been a real big uh, boon for uh, uh, cyber criminals, unfortunately, uh, and it's been across uh, sectors. So, you know, if you, you talk about Microsoft, you talk about Lion in terms of the brewery, in terms of beer, uh, Toll, I think, James, you mentioned earlier in terms of ransomware shutting down their entire sort of ability to uh, deliver goods uh, and services. Uh, if you look at JBS Australia, that was quite a famous um, use case from only a couple of months ago, Uniting Care Health uh, here in Queensland. There is um, probably not a week where you don't uh, see a, a breach being uh, announced or a breach being spoken about. And often people will say, well, well, why is this? Is it just because of COVID in terms of more people coming online? Uh, why is it? And, and the reason is, yes, it is partly because of COVID, but also too, from a cyber criminal perspective, their ability to exploit uh, consumers, exploit businesses, et cetera, have just, has just grown over the last couple of years. I often, uh, the analogy I use is that um, the, the, the available pie that they have in terms of who they can attack and who they can ransom money from or whose intellectual property they can steal has just grown as businesses come online. You know, the gentleman before spoke about the, uh, the innovation that's happening in, uh, in ag tech. As we uh, innovate, as we create more services, as we you know, move to the cloud, et cetera, all this is increasing that size of the pie that they have available to, to attack. And so thus, cyber criminals will follow uh, wherever the money is uh, and uh, how they can get uh, you know, money easily. And so thus, cyber crime has risen over the last uh, few years. And, and in the next couple of slides, I've got a, some few stats from here in Australia. One of the things I'll be talking specifically about is the, the JBS attack, which obviously is, is very uh, sector uh, specific for uh, agriculture. And in terms of uh, AJBS, and there was another uh, organization cooperative in the US um, called the uh, New Cooperative uh, that were attacked by ransomware. It essentially is a, um, what happened with JBS, and this is all public uh, knowledge, so I'm not talking about anything that's um, private or anything that, uh, you know, any sort of background knowledge I know. All this is, uh, is public knowledge. So JBS was attacked by what we call a Rebel, the Rebel ransomware gang. Uh, I don't know how they come up with these names. Russian speaking uh, ransomware as a service operation. Uh, initially, it was a $22.5 million ransom. Uh, you know, the, uh, the ransomware gangs being good businessmen negotiated to a, um, uh, to a bit of a lower amount as long as they paid within five days, which was uh, $11.5 million in Bitcoins, which makes it extremely hard to, uh, to track. They affected both the US and Australian system. So as we know, they've got a big footprint here in Australia. Essentially, they took off their ability uh, to uh, produce meat in some of their uh, plants, etc., for two weeks, right? And uh, what happened was it was a global shortage of uh, meat protein for uh, two weeks. It was a bit of a um, more of a nuisance value, uh, but what it showed is that uh, uh, ransomware attacking our food supply chain, right? Even though our food supply chain is somewhat disaggregated, but attacking at certain points of our supply chain could cause uh, a bit of a flow-on effect, and the. Uh, Typically, what these ransomware gangs do is they, they have this, uh, uh, I guess, uh, tactic where they expose and encrypt. So ransomware traditionally encrypts your data so you can't get access to it. And in the case of JBS, it encrypted a lot of their what we call operational technology systems that drove a lot of their um, slaughterhouses in particular. Um, so encrypted that and made uh, sure that they couldn't use it. But what they also do is they also expose. So they steal some of that data. They siphon it out. And they start putting it on the uh, on the internet, on the dark web, on the um, on the internet, and start threatening organisations, saying if you don't pay up in this amount of time, not only will the ransom go up, but what we'll also do is we'll start posting 
you know, details of your workers, of your customers, et cetera, online. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword for our customers. In the US, there was the new corp, uh, cooperative as well. They were done by a, a separate ransomware gang, uh, again, Russian speaking, which sort of, um, which sort of tells you a lot, uh, ransomware operation. And these were the same people that were responsible for the colonial pipeline operation about um, a month earlier. So new cooperative is a, is a farmers and feed grain cooperative around 60 locations throughout Iowa. Uh, the initial ransom was uh, $5.9 million in Bitcoin. And obviously the kicker there was if, it, if uh, they didn't pay within five days, that would almost nearly double to 11.8 million. And the same type of uh, tactic in terms of uh, exposing that steal data and start posting on the internet or threaten to, as well as encrypting data and ensuring that their systems couldn't uh, operate. Unfortunately, and this is becoming more and more prevalent, both these organizations paid up the ransom simply because uh, it was too expensive or the risk was too high of not paying it, not getting access to their data and or not being able to get the production systems uh, started up. The reason why I say, unfortunately, they paid the ransom is what it does is it, um, it essentially encourages the behavior of criminal gangs to go after large targets and then hold them up for ransom. Because what it does is it proves their, their business case. You pay a ransom, and uh, generally, what will happen, uh, you know, and there's been stuff in the media that says that sometimes these gangs won't pay up, et cetera, or won't, sorry, uh, won't give you the encryption keys, et cetera. But often I've found eight times out of 10, they will give you the uh, private key to decrypt your data if you do pay them because it's a business, right? And if you don't, uh, if someone pays you a ransom and you don't give them, uh, you don't give them back their data, you're unlikely to pay the ransom next time. So as a business, they will usually uh, give you back your data if you pay ransom. And unfortunately, what happens is more and more of these organizations are beginning to pay ransoms. Um, it's just proving the, uh, their business um, model, I guess, and it's making it harder and harder for uh, other businesses who are targeted. So now in terms so of- Lani, is, it, is, yes. there, is there negotiation points with that? Like, you know how you've got a hostage ransom situation, the negotiations with that, or is it just one sort of blanket, um, uh, I suppose, uh, attempt at, at uh, you know, at getting that that ransom. No, there's they're, um, they're they're quite it's a business model, right? So there are negotiation points where they'll say, look, we'll give you seven days and we'll drop the ransom to X amount. Basically, for for them, it's trying to extort the the best of what they can uh, from you. If that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. No, no worries. And so, um, what generally happens is that uh, ransomware is becoming a really lucrative business, right? And so generally how it works is that uh, you know traditionally it will just encrypt your data and then you get the private key back and they'll unencrypt your data give you back access what's happening now is that these criminal gangs are starting to develop out their business model so what they're doing is that rather than attacking individual businesses uh, you know let's say rather than attacking jbs what they're doing is they're actually going out to the criminal underworld and saying hey you know what instead of you going out and paying for your own systems to do this we will uh, rent you or lease you our systems in terms of our malware, our cloud systems, et cetera, for you to go out and get more victims. And essentially what they're doing is they're increasing, again, like I said, the size of their pie, increasing the amount of uh, victims, and et cetera, that they can reach. Now, the problem a lot of people think is this is a uh, corporate IT, this is a large organizational problem. But if you look at these stats from the Australian Cybersecurity Center, Predominantly, most of the, the threats that were um, uh, enacted over the last 12 months, fraud, uh, online uh, banking, et cetera, actually affected the medium-sized businesses. So those were the, uh, you know, up to 500 users in that business. So this is primarily, a, a, you know, excuse the pun, a, a, a pandemic of medium to small-sized businesses. It's not only those businesses, you, you'll hear the big businesses in the news, but it's primarily a challenge for the SME market because lack of resources, uh, et cetera. Now, in terms of what to do about it, it look, the good, thing, uh, the good thing is that there are a plethora of things that you can do in order to protect yourself. The bad thing is, is that there is a plethora of things that you can do to protect yourself. There, there simply is so much choice available. And I've got three things that, uh, three simple things that, uh, that can be done. One of them is uh, initially is raising awareness. That, that is the biggest thing, particularly from a board perspective. So things like board awareness engagements, security awareness uh, programs, et cetera. Knowing you know, where your data is, the value of your data, 
who's protecting your data. Essentially, your exposure is, is probably the key thing to start with. The next thing is, um, once you've done that, is to actually make a start right on a cybersecurity program. And this is uh, this can be done quite easily, as simply as picking a framework to use. Like there's a framework like the NIST cybersecurity framework, there's ISO frameworks, anything that will actually help you create and start building out a cybersecurity program. Uh, and then seek help, right? There's a lot of consultancies, a lot of industry groups that can uh, help as well. And then the uh, third thing is from a performance perspective, once you start building out your cybersecurity program in terms of starting to address some of those risks with um, uh, uh, mitigating controls, et cetera, is then you measure your performance. How is it doing? How's it uh, doing against the framework that you've chosen to, um, to build it on? And then continuously reporting that and then reporting to your board, reporting to your um, regulators, if your industry is uh, is sort of governed by regulators, the performance of that. And essentially, those are three simple steps. There, there are government resources from the Australian Cybersecurity Centre that uh, that can help as well. But um, yeah, it's very important to uh, to raise awareness, make a start, and measure those uh, performances. So uh, thank you. And if there's uh, any uh, questions. That's brilliant, uh, Lani. That is, it is so interesting and intriguing the ransomware and how that works, and and also just to how to how do I suppose to defend your your data because it's such a such a valuable uh, commodity now, and it is a commodity because there's there's a lot of it that's so valuable to an individual business. I think the uh, in terms of um, agribusiness, the the actual uh, I suppose turnover and magnitude of a agribusiness in Australia these days is actually quite significant. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's there's actually a lot of um, you know, opportunity for that sort of crime to take place in in agribusiness and disrupt the supply chain. And and in terms of, uh, uh, I suppose, Lani, uh, your experiences, uh, you, you know, can they be used as 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 a, as I suppose uh, tools of war? Like, you know, is it uh, is that is that uh, some of the uh, you know some some of the actual um, I suppose, critical parts of, of what's happening here? Yeah, look, they can. And uh, cybersecurity is being used now as what we call a, a tool for countries and a tool for nation states to exert their influence. So stealing data from, um, you know, uh, other countries, etc., using it to uh, fund other criminal groups to target countries is, is something that's being done uh, and, you know, dis especially disrupting supply chains for uh, other countries as well. Yeah, well, that's that's extraordinary. And uh, so, so, Lani, in terms of uh, vulnerabilities, you, you know, they, you know, the cyber uh, criminals must be looking at particular profiles within the business community to target. And it seems like they are large corporates. But, uh, but, you, but, you know, what would you say? Uh, you know, what would you say is is at risk? Are, are there small to medium enterprises at at, at at great risk as well of, of things like ransomware, or is, it, or is it more sort of just fraud and uh, and phishing sort of uh, I suppose initiatives? No, look, it definitely as I said, it's unfortunately a uh, a, a scourge for small to medium businesses, and it's purely because uh, small to medium businesses just don't have the resources as the large corporates do, uh, and often they don't have the level of awareness. Uh, you know, business owners, especially if they're um, you know small uh, micro businesses. Just don't have the time in terms of running their business to also invest in you know uh, cybersecurity controls as well. So unfortunately, that that is the case. Bigger businesses just have more resources uh, in order to uh, to do that. I, I t totally understand. So so yeah. So another element of uh, you know I suppose agribusiness and and farming is is these ag tech startups, Lani. So do you consult to many startups to actually inform them on how to uh, create I suppose uh, the uh, uh, I suppose the defences and and uh, and Lani, I think you've just dropped off there, so I might take that on notice and 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 uh, and put that in the in the follow up webinar, but uh, the uh, follow up um, email sent out. So so that's great, but Lani, that was just a tremendous uh, I suppose presentation and and something we've really got to think about, just like the solar uh, and uh, yeah, and so I might just uh, throw back to uh, to Randall and uh, and and Nick. We just got a couple of questions that have that have that have come up on the on the questionnaire, and and one of them is, I suppose, uh, Randall. 
one of the questions is uh, is battery storage technology where is it where, where does it need to be for an economic payback uh, for producers uh, you know are we still in the early days or you know uh, you, you talk about the energy storage but you know are, are batteries a, a, a real proposition I know we've got uh, you know batteries out here and, and we're sort of at the cutting edge of it but how do you see that evolving is the technology and the mineral and the resources there to, to actually uh, you know to create a solution there yeah, look, uh, okay, so really topical question in regards to the current battery which we use a lot of is the lithium battery. And if we're talking for off grid, it's a great solution, okay, because, you know, we're hedging uh, you know, probably against the diesel cost, right, if, if, if we start talking about paybacks. The lithium battery used for the standard storage system, um, the, and you're sort of asking, has it got there? It's there, but for me personally, it hasn't ticked all the boxes, okay? One of the things we do um, at, you know, at Proven Energy Management is we look at a battery and we try and find three reasons to use it, right? And um, if, if, you, if you can find three reasons to use the battery, it, it, like we can normally hit that payback, you know? So one of the, one of the, common, one of the common users is, you know, energy gets stored into the battery we use the we, we time shift we use the energy later on when the, you know when the sun's not available another another factor might be in in commercial environments peak demand management where a customer may have a network charge and they get blown out by the you know it, like we can use the battery to make sure they don't use a, like a maximum amount of power so they get charged network charges and a third one might be for backup you know, for, for backup on that site. But they're really hard to get a value, like it's really hard to get that value stack right. Domestically, I do struggle, I'm gonna get Nick to comment on this. I, I do struggle to see the payback and also working close, really closely with the warranty period. Nick, do you wanna make a comment Yeah, I, I suppose um, at the moment, particularly in a domestic, um, you know, household, small business kind of scenario, there's not enough of an incentive to have a battery because you tend to pay the same amount of power during the day as you do at night at the moment. Most tariffs are not yet really reflecting the true difference in cost between electricity and um, at, at, during the day and at night. But we will see tariffs change over time. Um, we will see things like feeding tariffs, you know, re reduced and eventually phased out, I would imagine, because um, at the moment, if you are getting paid a feed-in tariff to export your energy out into the grid, um, then that's a that's a loss if you're going to put that same energy into a battery. So you you immediately the arbitrage is is diluted. Um, so at the moment with batteries only really having what these lithium batteries in particular there are there are exceptions but most batteries have got warranties say between five and ten years it's hard to really um, make a business case for something that 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 can um, pay itself off you know in say seven or eight years um, so that's where it's at in most situations but there are definitely situations where batteries are valuable and worthwhile and part of a system and um, you know that's that that's the sort of you know work we have to do when we pull apart the data. But um, there are new technologies. As one I'm watching really really closely is the new graphene battery. You know some of the characteristics of that are really a much faster charging, um, not you know the end of life environmental um, case for that battery is better. Um, so but you know once again that technology is not here and it's you know it's coming I, I constantly see these technologies sort of move into the market um but you know i'm look i do think you know working you know once the networks start changing the way they charge for electricity um the batteries will come will come into play Brilliant. That's great. That's great, fellas. And, and I'd, I'd just like to thank you again for your involvement now in our ag tech, uh, you know, sort of uh, webinar launch for, for November. It's uh, It's been truly a, 
a uh, you know honour to have you on there, and I'd suggest for people that are looking to pursue solar to get into it because um, you know with the uh, with the commodity prices and and I suppose the uh, uh, the momentum that um, ag's got at the moment, it would be good to sort of um, reduce some some overhead costs and and get into solar while there's a little bit of uh, punch around in the. Uh, uh, in the account. So, so yeah, so I'd definitely encourage people to do that. But also for anyone that's developing um, solutions to to really think about that cyber security as well and uh, and potentially, uh, you know, the use of solar for any of the of the solutions that, that you're doing and talk to these guys and, and collaborate. But but yeah, thanks again, gentlemen. So what I'll do now, guys, is uh, is we'll just wrap up uh, and uh, and uh, and we'll just run through a couple of the events that we've got on that's quite exciting this month and and uh, no no way but a better way to sort of launch that with the uh, I suppose the um, the ag tech webinar that we've just had but uh, but particularly this Wednesday there's a there's a tremendous event on that's being live streamed it's called ag tech 21 build it use it profit and uh, it's hosted by Son Sonia Kamiski and Cassie Turner that's had a great uh, I suppose a great engagement there. They've got sort of over 300 people that are registered for this event that will be live streamed as well from Emerald Town Hall. Uh, it'd be tremendous for uh, for people to, uh, to to log into that. So that that that's all on the uh, I suppose on, on the website that will be provided in the in the letter to, to that finishes off and wraps up our webinar. Uh, the other the other events that are on is is EB Field Day uh, hosted by John McLaughlin in. Uh, uh, and I suppose in the far north at Mount Surprise in Nimbula uh, on the 9th and 11th. So it's just technologies bringing together the grazing industry in the north. Uh, there's some there's some other great events on as well, and I'd and I'd suggest to actually visit the 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 website uh, that we and the links that we give you in this in this follow up webinar uh, email and sort of look at that. But particularly uh, what we'd also like to draw your attention to, I suppose, is the uh, is particularly the uh, the ag tech and logistics hub that started in Tormund. Now every Wednesday they've actually got a, a come and sit in day that uh, that you can register for and, and go and and uh, and explore. I suppose the ecosystem down there. Uh, the the ag tech and logistics hub has also got sort of uh, branches off into the regions and they're trying to establish that at the moment. So so that's uh, so it's actually a great facility and worthwhile travelling to if you're starting up an ag tech solution in Queensland or you or you want an overview of ag tech in Queensland from a producer point of view or a corporate point of view if if you know the likes of of uh, you know uh, proven energy or or. Uh, cyber metrics uh, wanted to to see what what's happening in the industry. They could go down there and and check in with Stephen Dummett. But it's well supported by the Queensland government as well. And uh, and yeah, so I'd suggest everyone just sort of get on there and have a look what's happening in in the month of November. And uh, and it, it it is an extreme month for Queensland ag tech and something that's worth cheering for and shouting out about uh, because uh, you know we're, we're sort of an undercurrent of the, at the moment that's that's evolving quite quickly and coming together so so uh, so in in wrapping up I'd just like to say thank you again to our presenters and for the uh, for the launch to be opened officially by Mark Ferner and uh, and all the support staff uh, particularly uh, Kimberly and Kaylee for uh, for helping us out from DAF to host this so so thanks very much everyone if you want to get in touch our details will be on on that on the letter as well that follows this uh, uh, this webinar and uh, and thank you again for everyone uh, and hopefully we get some rain and uh, and sunlight for the solar energy and uh, thanks very much for uh, for tuning in.